everybody to this first session in the external speaker series that we organized it's an attempt to bring people working um or it's an it's an attempt to foster an exchange between the people working on methodological and theoretical aspects of um causality namely uh, all of them or most of the participants of this program um with people uh, work coming at it from a different angle so uh, for instance people uh, that are working with real world data trying to distill uh, causal relations that are informative for policymakers. Um, so we will have uh, philosophers, physicists, engineers, and today a political scientist in this, uh, in this series. Professor Cecilia Mont is a political scientist and uh, uh, working also in, uh, on public policy. And um, for reason, I, will not, uh, I will not talk much about uh, the long list of awards and uh, achievements which you can find on our website but uh, i want to say that she's working on economic inequality and the relation or the effect of economic inequality on um, political participation and she's also working on how can we cultivate uh, democratic norms in the youth of uh, yeah in the youth which will be the future future uh, which will be the future constituents of these democratic entities and i think those are uh, two very uh, topical um, topical um, questions especially in this political climate that we're living in right now geopolitical climate one might say so i'm very uh, pleased to uh, welcome uh, cecilia to give a talk on uh, recent work on the effect of uh, national service on beliefs uh, mindsets and life pathways um, I don't want to take uh, much uh, more of your time, and uh, please join me in welcoming Cecilia. Thank you. I mean, it seems feels a little awkward having a mic. Like I feel like I can use my teacher voice. But in any case, uh, thank you so much for uh, um, inviting me here. Um, yeah, I was looking at the speaker series. I was like, I do very different kind of work than the typical speakers that come through. Um, I do applied work. Um, I, I often work with. Um, partners that are doing programmatic interventions to start, you know, to think about um, how those interventions affect different outcomes that we might care about, which might be trust in government, political participation, voter turnout, um, things of that sort. So this project is actually um, uh, kind of a longstanding partnership that I have with Teach for All. Teach for All is a, a consortium of about 50 organizations around the world. Um, Teach for America is probably the one that's sort of best known in the United States, um, but uh, it's this group of organizations that are trying to address issues of inequality by recruiting uh, recent graduates to teach essentially for about two years in low-income communities. Um, and a lot of the research that's been done thus far in those organizations are just more working on, well, how do they impact the constituents they serve and the constituents being really, you know, children that they're uh, working with in the classroom. But another part, like really in these service organizations, part of their theory of change is to affect the participants themselves. Right, thinking about, well, what happens to the participants? And if we recruit these young promising graduates who, you know, whether they stay in the classroom or go and like run for office or do other things, do they then have a different view of the world that will then lead to different kinds of policy making, uh, different kinds of career choices, and then just more general civic engagement, um, things that are problematic in a lot of uh, democracies currently. Um, so I'll share sort of different sets of findings that leverage both administrative data and survey data. Um, so these are sort of, I think, like five different papers that I've pieced together to just kind of give you a taste of the different kinds of outcomes uh, that we've been looking at utilizing the same kind of causal identification strategy. Okay. Um, so basically, theoretically, right, from this, the standpoint of social science, like in terms of why is this interesting to a person like myself, I was interested in looking at national service, because if we look at the history of national service, it actually begins with a speech where uh, they paralleled national service as a moral equivalent of war. So what does that mean? Um, it's a sense that, you know, during peacetime, right, then unlike during wartime, right? Like people are off to war, they're like going and doing something for their country. And it, like, it, it, it incites sort of patriotism and involvement and sense of duty. But during peacetime, there was this worry that people will just become selfish little egos that don't need to worry about anyone other than themselves. And because life is kind of calm and then so forth, that we're going to then have a society of individuals that don't really care about one another. And then that creates um, a setting, a set of norms that would compromise things that we need in terms of a healthy democracy. 
right? So what are national service programs? They recruit promising college graduates um, that will be future leaders, right? That's one of the features. They tend to put future leaders into contact with disadvantaged populations, right? Some, some group that needs assistance uh, in the context of some kind of social ill. And it usually requires intensive intergroup contact um, because it's a, you know, you're in that community for a minimum of about two years. As I said, um, national service was likened to, uh, to be the moral equivalent of war. So here's this one quote. Um, so from that speech in 1910, William James argued that youth service is the moral equivalent of war and could be a mechanism by which the gilded youth that would have healthier, um, would have healthier sympathies and sober ideas, and that through service, a stable system of morals of civic honor built itself up. So there's all these claims that are being made, um, but it's not really been empirically studied, right, in an intensive way, like there have been sort of case studies, um, interviews of alumni, but that doesn't really actually tease out whether or not these programs are having the desired effect. One could sort of think that there's just selection bias, right? These organizations are just basically able to sort out the individuals in society that would basically care about um, things like civic engagement, political participation to begin with. So you don't want to think that these organizations are doing anything other than sorting out the types of individuals um, that have, have, have certain kinds of values. And right now there's a lot of discussions around sort of reinvesting in national service programs. Um, so in light of COVID, there's been discussions around a pandemic response and opportunity through National Service Act, right? Investing in opportunities to try to grow national service as a way of actually, you know, cultivating some healing post pandemic um, within political campaigns, you know, prominent uh, candidates like Pete Buttigieg, like they actually like ran on a platform saying that they're really going to increase and create a larger network of national service programs. And, and California and UC Berkeley recently signed on. Um, uh, Gavin, Governor Gavin Newsom just created this California for all college core and UC Berkeley is one of its participants to try to create debt free pathways to increase service um, for for college students so discussions around how to maybe use national service as a way to kind of respond to some problems that have arisen in terms of student debt around polarization around people not caring for one another and so forth. So in terms of the theory of change um, from the social science standpoint, like we've you know, explored a lot around the contact hypothesis and what happens when people just come together. Turns out it's not so easy. All kinds of contact isn't necessarily good. Um, there's been work like say from like Bob Putnam who, speak, who spoke to, if you have a lot of people who are different from one another, kind of just hang out, um, you actually see breakdowns in civic engagement, breakdown in trust, just because there are people that are just bumping into one another that don't actually know one another. And so what is necessary are more deep, prolonged opportunities for contact, which then um, allow for this opportunity to have what they call sort of friendship potential, right? To actually hear each other's stories. Um, and there's other work that speaks to how context matters a lot, right? Having contact one, with one another in like segregated, highly kind of hostile settings is going to be very different than in a context where you're trying to help one another. So in say like a service context, uh, that's going to be a very different context in which people are coming together. The other feature of why I thought that national service is really promising is that it's actually targeting people at a very critical juncture, right? It's during young adulthood, um, and that's viewed as a time in like sociology as like the place in which political, the, the time in people's life histories where politicized identities and a sense of group interest really start forming. Um, so that sort of period seems prime for seeing uh, the effects that one might want to see. Uh, so the idea is like if you then marry kind of these people who are kind of um, malleable uh, with organized action, material, social, and cognitive resources for support and an opportunity to participate in a just cause, you might actually start seeing things that you would desire, increased civic engagement, increased sense of political efficacy, and participation with an ethic of concern for the welfare of others, which is ultimately, you know, what we normatively want to see. So research question. So what are the impacts of youth national service programs and democratic citizenship? That was sort of the larger question that I've been asking. And you can think about, well, when you're thinking about impacts, how might it affect attitudes, right? Just like views, how might it actually uh, change like tolerance, 
levels of prejudice? Um, how might it change behaviors as it relates to civic and political participation? How might it change your life trajectory in terms of what careers you choose to pursue? Um, and then what effect might it have in terms of how you assess policy reform? So in terms of the data that I leverage, um, so this is, like I said, this has been a partnership with Teach for All. So uh, most of my findings so far from Teach for America as it's the most mature organization. Uh, so it was leveraging the 2007 through 2015 cohorts. 2007 was the moment in which uh, there was this really nice feature that developed um, within Teach for America, which is their selection process um, involved having a threshold score. So um, with these programs, it's really difficult to do sort of that gold standard RCT. You're not going to convince an organization to just randomly admit people into their programs because usually institutions think, well, there's a certain kind of person that we're looking for to, to make sure that they're going to do the kinds of service that we want them to do. So randomization is off the table, um, but TFA uh, has been a highly selective organization inviting something like 50,000 applications in any given year for about 3000 spots. Um, and during those cohorts for 2007 and 2015, 120,000 upwards of that number uh, made it to sort of the final stage of the interview process. So these are people that were close to being like, you know, they were, they were viable for being admitted. And so those are the individuals that I really targeted for the study. Teach for India has a similar process, but a less mature organization. So it has a smaller sample size and same for Teach for Australia. So I married this um, data set uh, with um, a survey, an original survey that I collected back in 2015 that was open for about six months um, that had various questions around these dimensions that I outlined as core to the study. Um, and within our world, we're constantly looking to try to increase response rates. Generally with targeted samples, you're not able to achieve a response rate more than about 10%, um, but with high levels of incentives and things of that sort, we we're able to get about a quarter of those that we targeted to actually respond to the survey. Um, correlation causation, right? I just said, you know, we worry about selection bias, like that's the core thing, uh, which is uh, why we want to try leveraging um, a quasi-experimental design um, to, to tease out causal effects. So for the quasi-experimental analysis, um, most of my findings are using the RDD approach. Um, in Teach for India, we had to use a genetic matching strategy uh, to try to um, to, to estimate causal effects because their threshold was compromised um, uh, in the sense of interviewers actually knew the threshold. So if interviewers know the threshold, then you might start seeing gaming of interviewers in terms of trying to have scores that are higher for those who like right above the threshold, if you really want them to get in. Um, so certain assumptions don't hold. And so for Teach for India, we, we tried looking at um, uh, effects using a genetic matching uh, strategy. But for the RD approach, um, we need to have that first stage, right? Like a nice discontinuity in terms of an increase in probability of being admitted um, at that threshold score. And that's what we see about a 30 percentage point difference right at that threshold of um, the probability of being granted admission. This is not a sharp discontinuity, it's probabilistic as those below the threshold might be reconsidered um, because of some other feature of their um, of their application, right? Um, for instance, the Teach for America is really trying to recruit more men of color, right? Because there's a really low number of, well, generally the, the skew is that with teachers, are, it's majority female. And then if you think of how many among the few men that go into the teaching profession, how many of them are men of color, um, it's very small. And at least within the education setting in terms of student score outcomes, the lowest performing kids are boys of color. And so there's sort of prioritization of men of color. So you might have some that are below the threshold that are ultimately granted admit, admission because there's these like other features to consider. And then there might be those who are above the threshold that there might be some other things going on that ultimately they decide not to admit that person. Yes, Can go I, ahead. Just, just a quick clarification. The admission score, I'm just naive to what, I don't know what that is. Are these academic? features or what, what goes into that sort of score? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the Teach for America admissions, I think think a lot about like college admissions or uh, graduate admissions. There's letters of recommendations. There might be transcripts that are submitted. There's personal statements. And then there's interviews. So those who make it through sort of the initial review based upon just what they submit on paper. 
are then going to be interviewed with individuals just to sort of talk about, um, you know, why they want to join Teach for America. And then they're also asked to do uh, a teaching sample where they're asked to do just a demonstration of a lesson uh, to show that if you're in front of a classroom, in front of kids, like, can you teach something? So you're asked to do like a 15 minute demo. Um, so those are all the things that go into this admission score, which is a weighted average of all of these dimensions um, that importantly, the interviewers don't know about and no one other than a small group of individuals in the admissions team like know actually the threshold score, which then allows for us to take advantage of this because no one is gaming this process because no one has any idea if the cut point is at 50, 60, 65, like no one knows that. Um, so that helps us um, know that certain assumptions that need to hold to really be able to leverage an RDD analysis um, and holds. And you know, I think with a regression discontinuity approach, that's something that many of our colleagues um, emphasize that the kind of qualitative work is really important because you have to know a lot about the process to actually know whether or not those assumptions hold. Right, so it means actually talking to those individuals and like seeing um, the admissions process. So for this, um, I actually shadowed an admissions team and saw just to make sure that certain things that I think needed to hold like were actually reflected in reality. Um, so yeah, so that's so the admission score is a running variable here, and then the cutoff. Um, it's some arbitrary number and it changes and it changes from year to year. So we standardize the year um, to have zero be the cut point um, across each of the each of the co each of the cohorts. So for the first study, this is really looking at um, attitudinal shifts, and this is from a paper that was published in 2018 that was looking at you know how are they viewing um, um, how are they viewing things around like, you know, why are people poor? Like are people of color like less deserving of assistance? Um, and so what I did see is that there's an increased perception that there are really huge issues in terms of our political system, that there was a tendency to have external features be emphasized more as opposed to internal. Like what I mean by that is as opposed to blaming people for being poor, they're more likely to say it's actually systemic issues that are causing issues of poverty and less about say a person being lazy or um, you know thoughtless or you know any of those things where it's just blaming traits around the individuals and things that we do here in the narrative of like, oh my goodness, we cannot give out welfare programs because they're just gonna go and buy a phone or like waste it on alcohol, right? Like those, that kind of view is more focusing on internal attributes and blaming as opposed to an external set of circumstances of like the structure makes it impossible for people who are poor to get out of poverty. Right. And then also evidence that there was decreased um, prejudice and the effects were durable in the sense of we're looking at some of these effects when they are nine years out of the program. Right, so this is not just two weeks after or a day after. These are seeing are the effects present a month after, a year after, two years, and up to nine years after. And we find that that is true, which is really nice to be able to see as a lot of studies, especially those in psych where they're doing kind of laboratory studies, they're doing, they're looking at effects that tend to just be within a very short window of time and long-term is within months as opposed to years. Yes, go ahead. Quick clarification, when you say, if you mean effects uh, comparing participants to non-participants, but not participants to their prior, um, it's not within subject change, it's across. That's, that's right. So we're comparing those who are barely admitted to those who are barely rejected. So it's a very localized treatment effect, right? So then you know, there's those trade-offs of like, you, you can get that internal valid, internally valid estimate, but then it's actually very localized to those that are just above the cutoff and below. We can't externalize to those who are even like broader within the sample. And obviously we are only looking at um, those who applied, right? So if we actually look at a sample, of, if somehow you convinced people who wouldn't be inclined to volunteer to do these programs, would we see similar effects? And the answer is like, we, we can't actually generalize from this. But I have a question about dance question. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you're saying what you're doing, like I understand that that's what in fact she's doing with the research design, but isn't the point of it is to make these counterfactual claims about individual subjects. I mean, the point of it is to be able to say, like if the marginal Dan, Dan, like hadn't done Teach for America, he would have been more of a right-wing asshole. Like, 
I mean, so as I understand that, like, because of the fundamental problem of causal inference and all this stuff, like, we have to do it this way, but isn't yes. that the point of it is to make that individual level thing? Well, I, I mean, this is like a long debate, I guess, but like, it's dangerous to, I think, draw those kinds of conclusions from these kinds of local treatment effects, because they're, they're like, we don't know anything about how the person, like, what the, the person's attitudes or, or views were before they entered the program. So it's not really about how they changed as a person, but it's like, how much does program participation, like how, how do program participants change from program applicants who are not participants? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, maybe this is just, a, sorry. but again, it's like, I understand that you have to do it this way because we only have data about two different groups of people, but, it, that's the reason we call it causal inference is because we think that what this data is telling us is like, if a particular person hadn't done this, someone that already had this propensity to, to engage in it, that they would have been slightly less empathetic or civically minded. I mean, like, otherwise, why, why not just look at two different people and just make a, a statistical claim? I mean, again, like I understand that that's, and I think, and again, like the local average treatment effect seems to be conceptual here, not just like a matter of external validity, because what would it even mean to like, right, you know, the whole point is to, is it, it, this is an institution that is selective. You're not asking about an institution that's, that's the draft. You're asking about an institution that is selective. So it seems to me that conceptually you want to limit it, right? I mean, I'm asking, I'm asking the speaker, wouldn't, I mean, isn't that the case? Yeah. But I mean, like if we say, I mean, we are actually going to do a study that follows up individuals to look at within individual change, but even then like, that's not actually a better design. That's just, you know, trying to get like illustrative, like, do we see kind of consistent patterns and maybe there might be differences depending on the type of individual, right? Because every person is still different, right? So like some participants might actually be coming with greater, um, greater, knowledge around like what it feels to be poor because they themselves grew up in a family with like food stamps and things of that sort, right? So all we have is just more of an average of like the kinds of individuals that tend to be barely admitted versus the average of the type of people who don't, uh, that were barely rejected. And we're just comparing the averages. Like we can't say anything about sort of dimensions of people and how that might make effects larger or smaller. And so the heterogeneity is, is, is not able to be sort of assessed here in terms of what are the dimensions of the person like all we have is sort of this averaging of like all of the people who like happen to be barely admitted and the average of all the people who are fairly rejected and from that at least being able to I think you know it's fair to still be able to say like we can still infer like if it's a if it's a positive or a negative effect or if it's an effect that seems to be notably large versus small in relation to other studies that are similarly using either IRCTs or um, quasi experimental designs. Um, but yeah, we're not like we can't actually say anything about like a specific type of person here. But I don't think we, that's what we want to do here when we're trying to estimate programmatic effects. I'm sorry, I, 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 I promise this is the last question on this, but it seems to me that you do want to say something both about a particular type of person. Mm -hmm. Because you, you do like, you want to say something about people who apply to Teach for America, mm -hmm. not about, you know, the population at large. And second, like, it just seems that there's, that if you, that the, the fact that it's a very localized treatment effect just seems conceptual, right? I mean, it's just, it is a different treatment to randomize people to teach for two years than it is to select people who have applied to teach for two years. So yes. why would we want to, to know about, I mean, it's just, it seems like that's the research question. It, it isn't a research question about the effect of randomizing people to teach, right? We could, you know, actually argue that the effects that we get from this kind of design might be conservative estimates, and we can sort of think about whether or not it's a conservative or non-conservative estimate. Because if I look at sort of the the graphs of like where opinions are among those who are um, just to this to this side of the threshold, um, I mean, there there's and, and a lot of the outcomes that I care about, there is sort of like an upward slope. So one could argue like maybe if we did randomize among the people that are here like the effects could be bigger but then you could also say like maybe the effects could be smaller and that's an open question um so the the answer that I have for you is more we should look at heterogeneity 
And then it's not actually obvious to me whether or not what we have is a conservative or non-conservative estimate. And I think that's sort of a theoretical question of like, what do we think that this, like looking at the localized average treatment effect, is that going to be a conservative estimate? And I can make arguments that it, it should, but there's also arguments I can make for that might actually not be a conservative estimate. Um, so there's, in, in trying to get some causal, like causal purchase, like there are still things that we're not able to fully clarify in terms of heterogeneity, but we can do some. So we did do some effects of just like looking at subgroups. Like if we look at just like women, if we looked at just uh, white participants, if we looked at just participants who are older, like do we see different patterns? And, and generally we don't. And so like that gives us some sense that this is kind of, you know, across different demographic features, you might still see similar patterns, um, but I can't say like, you know, if it's gonna be smaller or larger, and all of that, and that's still kind of up for debate. Um, like even how I wrote this paper, I was like, might be conservative, it might actually be smaller. I don't know, um, because the the way that I say that it could be conservative is for the those who are applying for this organization, they are not, as you said, sort of like right wing, like they they are not the white supremacists who are applying for these programs, right? But like if they were to do, like there are people that are already probably answering in very progressive, kind of empathetic ways. So then there might be a ceiling effect. And so like, they're already kind of mostly there. So then the effect might actually be kind of smaller. And if we took people who weren't mostly there, there's more, op there's more space for them to grow. But then there might also then be a reason to believe those who are not inclined to apply, they're not open to change. And so you can do all of this, but they're just going to be resistant and doesn't actually matter. So there might be a smaller change. So there's, there's arguments for thinking that this effect that I have is smaller, like might actually be larger if we like looked at kind of everybody um, and then did like the gold standard study, but it might also be smaller. And the answer is like, I don't know. But what we have is at least this localized average treatment effect conditional upon people who are interested in applying. Yes. Yeah, I think, I guess, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think from the policy, uh, from my understanding of the like sort of policy relevance of of the kind of local average effect. And I don't know if this helps answer Issa's question, but like you have to start off with this idea about like, what's the population that the program is available to? It's like the population of applicants to this program. And then there's something about like the average um, empathy beliefs post-program. And you can imagine like, what would be the different, what would be the new average empathy beliefs in that population if I were to like shift the the threshold for admission down and therefore admit more people. Right? So it's like, if I had changed the program to include more people from this larger population, what would be the average empathy, um, you know, uh, empathy change? But it has to be very local changes to the threshold. That's right. I don't know if that is helpful. So just like some illustrative, like basically if we look at questions, so, so this sort of gives a sense of the language. So it can just read things like level of respect for US political institutions or a sense that uh, citizens basic rights are protected by US political system. You're basically seeing about a 10 percentage point drop. So all the questions were recoded to be between zero and one. So about a 10 percentage point drop and um, when we, the questions that I use were questions that are present in things like the America's Barometer or the um, World Value Survey. So you can sort of benchmark like, how do Germans respond to these questions? Or how do those in um, Korea respond to these questions? Just to kind of get a sense of um, when you see a 10, 10 percentage point drop, is that significant or is that pretty small? Um, it tends to be that it's actually pretty large, like when we're comparing you know, just like responses um, to these types of questions across different countries. Um, and when we're asking questions around like contributors of education inequality, as I said earlier, it's a sense of less, like less blaming. So things like um, do poor, do you agree or disagree that poor families don't value education as much as richer families? So things of that sort of like, how are you agreeing or disagreeing with questions like that uh, to get a sense of what do you think contributes towards um, low income students not performing as well? Yeah, go ahead. No, just also clarification. So what, one, the first two questions don't seem to have anything obviously to do with teaching. Uh, so I'd be curious what you think is going on there. Mm -hmm. And the second is uh, about the numbers of the, uh, of the, of the magnitude of the change. Mm -hmm. Is there any sense of what sort of other interventions 
achieve similar or larger change. So uh, that, like, I don't have a good scale to think about how, how big of an impact this is. Yeah. Um, so these first set of questions around political institutions. Um, I mean, teachers are about 20% of state and local government employees, right? Like in terms of public school teachers. So when they're going into uh, the classroom, they are still government employees. And what they are seeing is how the school may or may not be functioning well, right? So you go in and you might see, okay, so these kids are expected to learn and yet they have outdated textbooks or their chairs are falling apart. Or I see um, other teachers in the school that are reading the newspaper in the back of the room as opposed to doing instruction. So when you start seeing those things, you might start quibble with, actually, is this, is this education system working in the way that it's supposed to as that's a major public good that the governments provide, like health, education, things of that sort, right? So being a teacher in a poorly, poor, um, in a dysfunctional school, right? These aren't the excellent schools. By design, TFA is assigning teachers to schools that are kind of desperately needing teachers because they are experiencing lots of teacher turnover or not able to actually recruit people to come into classrooms. Um, and so, that, that's that's where I see like it's it's um, not a reach to think that you might just be disappointed with how political systems are functioning because you're actually seeing the lack of services that children um, um, in poor communities like just like the the level of services are just not acceptable right so that's that's where I would um, not I'm not surprised that you're seeing the shift that uh, shift in disappointment and in terms of that 10 percentage point bump um, change. Um, could say like it's I think it's about a third of the difference of um, how Haitians would answer this questions versus Americans would answer this questions and if you're looking at a country that's sort of like a failed state where the government is really imploding right sort of a third of that difference of like how Haitians view their government versus Americans like it's it's not trivial which is why it's useful for um, folks like us who are you know using survey measures to even if they're problematic questions and like I get this question of well, that question wasn't really good. Like, why did you use it? There's that trade-off of like, well, I can use a better question or I can use a question that's been asked readily around the world. And at least by asking that question that's been asked, I can do some benchmarking to get a sense of, are these large or small magnitudes? Um, hence uh, our choice to pick, you know, maybe somewhat imperfect, but questions that have been asked around the world for many, many years um, to be able to benchmark. Um, Ask different questions around this is what we call um, um, these are things around just class and income. So, you know, is it government as opposed to individuals should take more responsibility to ensure that everyone is provided for? Um, income should be made more equal as opposed to unequal um, to incentivize individual, individual effort. And again, here we're seeing shifts uh, where it's in a direction of causing people to. Um, have beliefs that are more situational environmental factors are important as opposed to blaming individuals who have poor outcomes. And in terms of these effect sizes, um, they're about like the half the difference of um, how say like Germans would answer this question in a, in a so when I say German, it's because Germany, it's because Germany is a place with a much, much more robust social safety net um, than in the US where it tends to be like, you know, you got to pull yourself up from the bootstraps. Um, so in terms of sort of trying to contextualize these magnitudes, but everything is um, consistent in the direction of blaming si the system as opposed to individuals. And then there are a set of questions that what we use um, in American politics are these like racial resentment questions of do you, um, so it's things like, do you agree that blacks should overcome prejudice without special favors or agree that uh, it's really just a matter of blacks working harder to be just as well off as white. So these are questions that are asked regularly in the American national election study to get a um, pulse of how racist Americans are. Um, and so what we see is a drop in racial resentment um, and that drop is about, in terms of the size, half the difference of how African Americans would answer these questions versus white Americans. So again, like not trivial magnitudes. Um, and a general uh, sense of you know, being less satisfied with how all minority groups are treated. Um, those are all self-reported measures. Um, so we also did the skin color IAT. So this is something that was developed by um, those in psychology where you're just kind of 
categorizing pictures with words. Um, so it's harder to blame just to kind of get a sense of how much more do you associate, say, you know, people of color with negativity, with negative terms, as opposed to whites with negative terms. And so when we see that, um, we see that there's a drop um, in uh, sort of a marginal drop in um, skin color bias as measured by the skin color IAT. Um, and the, this 0.121 is about the difference of how Hispanics would um, would do on a skin color IAT versus white individuals. Um, there's not real change in terms of feeling closeness to minority groups. Uh, about 90% of the student population that TFA participants work with are kids of color. Um, so that's why we asked questions around feeling closeness to Blacks or Hispanics. However, the assignments are actually pretty different. So if you're assigned to Rio Grande Valley, like the like almost 100% of your students are Hispanic. They're not African-American. But if you're assigned to Detroit, then you're really not working with Hispanic students. You're working with African-American students. So we start separating out the, um, the admits uh, based upon assignment to like what communities you're assigned to. You see that the kind of larger effects are, um, you, you see an increase in affinity to people of color of like Black, Hispanic separately when you're actually assigned to classrooms where the majority of your students are of that group. Um, so significance of findings, um, this was something that a lot of uh, those, at least in my uh, public science and public policy world, that was remarkable as it turns out it's really, really difficult to have people um, feel closer to others, like polar <laughs> increasing polarization is a lot easier than decreasing polarization. And like getting um, more perspective taking is a lot more, is, is really difficult. These things are not easy to move. So to be able to see evidence of some movement um, is, is one that um, was sort of viewed as, as good news and um, one that justifies maybe that uh, government um, and nonprofits should be investing more in these national service tech programs. Let's go ahead. Uh, relating to one of the treatment that you were studying. Um, and earlier you mentioned that you, had, you can actually detect very long term effects, right? Over mm -hmm. eight, eight years. So the treatment effects that you have shown us are those short term treatment effects. Mm -hmm. It's averaged. Yeah, so it's an average if you take everyone that, um, that like in terms of the alumni, it would have been up from six months up to nine years distant from the program. So this is an average. So if I like mapped out, um, just like by alumni group. Um, in some cases, it's pretty steady. In other cases, you actually see the effects getting larger. And I think the reason why the effects are getting larger for some groups is that, say you, you have this change, and then you decide, well, I'm also going to marry someone that is you know, person that's of a different background. I'm going to live in a community that is more diverse. I'm also going to choose jobs that are, so like if you start making a, a other decisions after the short-term effect that keep on compounding these effects, it's not, it's not um, kind of unimaginable for these effects to actually be getting larger over time. So it depended on the question, but it was either kind of like pretty sticky or actually in, in some cases, the effects were getting larger over time. But all the things that are reported, it's just clumping all of them together. As with RDDs, it's very, it's very sample hungry, right? Uh, because you are really only focusing on those who are close to the cutoff. So it turns out like you actually need a lot of people there to, to be able to estimate effects. Um, so none of the things that I reported are behaviors. Um, these are self-reported questions. So um, something that is that I'm working on right now um, is, uh, does it actually catalyze greater political engagement? So I told you that people get more disappointed with the system, but they're more empathetic in terms of people of color and the, those who are low income. Do they then become sort of ostriches putting their head in the sand and going like, okay, the world sucks, I'm just gonna withdraw, or the world is terrible, I need to do something about it, right? So what we did was we merged our, uh, the Teach for America's administrative file with uh, actual voting records. Um, so actual voting records are things that you know are there. It's um, and so groups like Data Trust, um, they collect all of those records to be able to kind of keep tabs on who are the people who are actively voting. This data tends to be leveraged a lot more by kind of campaign 
consulting groups, right? To just like help candidates know where they should be allocating their resources because they want to really target those who are going to show up to the ballot box as opposed to those who are, you know, not really interested. So we merged our file with administrative records of, of voting. Um, and we matched um, based upon permanent address, um, college location state, current location state from the survey, and then name and birthday to be able to find the right Sally Smith born in 1982 or whatnot, right? Um, so the, the, the merging endeavor was not trivial, um, but we did that. And uh, the quality of the data trust data is, is pretty high. Um, we were able to get this courtesy of my co-author, John Holbein, who was at BYU and was able to get approval from Mitch Romney. And so we were able to get this data via Mitch Romney because data trust is actually what the Republican Party uses to, to contact their voters. Um, so, so that's what we're using and that's what the Republican Party is using. So it's, it's sort of as reliable of data as one can feasibly get um, as it relates to people's voting records. Um, and so what we're seeing is right at that cutoff, if we're just looking at, you know, the running variable and just a simple graph, it's really nice is that you can actually see a clear pattern right at that discontinuity that something happened like so, you know, before I even so with the fuzzy RDD right like you're scaling your reduced form value with your first stage don't even have to do any of that we're seeing that right at that cutoff, we're seeing a jump in terms of the likelihood of voting in elections. Um, so I was really excited to see this because uh, at least in this country, youth participation is abysmal. Um, here it is. So if we look at how each of the generation, the silent generation, boomer, Gen X and millennials, the rate at which they were voting when they were 18 to 24 to like 45 to 49, you see an upward trajectory and likelihood of voting as you age. But then you're also seeing that with each generation, you're seeing this intercept shift. So the, tr the trend is that with each generation, the, the propensity to vote is going down. Um, so that creates problems uh, as it relates to representation. It basically means that um, those who we elect are more reflective of those who are older, of what they want, as opposed to those who are young, right? And then who's going to sort of inherit the policy preferences? The youth, right? They're going to have to live with the decisions that are being made right now for a much longer period, but their participation rate is much lower. And when we're looking at the turnout gap between those who are older versus younger across a range of democracies, the, U the U.S. has um, is amongst the highest in terms of having an age gap in, in turnout. So we have a serious problem in this country as it relates to the youth under um, like not coming out to vote and then the older folks coming out to vote in a robust way. Um, so. Um, and why we are focusing on like this as a context, about 80% of those who apply to these national service programs tend to be like just out of college, right? So if we're looking at things like Peace Corps, Amer uh, AmeriCorps programs, Teach for America, they're mostly recruiting on college campuses. So 80% of those who apply are like college seniors. And then there's another set of people that might be like one or two or three years out of college. But they're, they're of the kind of 18 to 24 variety, right? The, the typical profile is about 21, 22. Um, so trying to get, get this group and seeing, does this program actually lead them to have greater turnout? And it turns out that it seems like that's the case. And getting them to turn out once is, is, is important because you could ask like, well, this is just turning out, you're looking at two elections. Like we looked at the 2014 and 2012 elections. Um, we didn't look at historical elections because in this country, states purge voting records. So it means that the out, like elections from many years ago, that data is not entirely correct because people were purged out. Um, so you wanna look at more of the recent uh, elections because that's going to be most accurate. But voting tends to be habitual and sticky. So just getting them out once is, is kind of getting them almost there for them being kind of voters that are going to readily, readily turn out. Getting them just there once is going to be enough to maybe propel them to be folks who are voting at a fairly regular um, basis because voting is habitual. Yes, go ahead. Can I ask a question? I'm sorry, just, I have to leave a little earlier than I wanted to, but can I ask why? So why is the selection story bad? I mean, you started off your, story, your talk by saying, like, we don't want it to be the case that what these institutions are doing are just selecting. We want to show that there's a causal effect. 
And, you know, you look at this and someone could say, you know, that's perfectly compatible with the following story. This institution is just really, really good at selection. Like there is no counterpart. It's like the Nobel prize. Like you, I don't know what you mean when you say like, what would have happened if, you know, would they have gotten as many sites if they had gotten the Nobel prize because they just wouldn't have been as good. Like the best person just gets it. And what this institution is doing is just selecting the people that are going to be, you know, and, and, but I don't understand like why, and this is like a genuine question as someone that's engaged in this type, like, why do we have to, why do you have to make the claim that there is this causal effect? Why not say, yeah, it is the institution that's really good at selecting on that. And it's good for us to fund that. I don't have to tell you a counterfactual story where if they hadn't participated in Teach for America, they wouldn't have become a more civically minded person. You know, like we should just fund things that are the mechanisms by which people that have a propensity to become good civic yeah. actors, that they that they do. There is no, like, I mean, what, what's wrong with that? I don't think anything is wrong per se. I think it's helpful to know both, right? So like what this actually figure tells you is like, as they get higher scores, you're also seeing kind of like an upward slope. So it does seem like whatever TFA is using in terms of their weights and whatnot, those who are getting through the highest scores are also the types of people who are mostly engaged in all of that. So there's something to their selection process. But then it's also helpful to know that being in the program itself is also doing something, right? Like they, they are sorting, they are able to like pick out people to like, it's like, let me show you, these are the people that are of a certain type. They are doing that. But it seems like what they're also doing is that they're changing those types to be even more of something that is normatively desirable from the standpoint of the organization and from many donors who fund them. So I think it's just helpful to identify that there's something to how they're selecting to help us identify the types of people, but they're also causing people to change that it's not just it's not just sorting. Right. So I don't think it has to be. Uh, an or it could be an and of like it is really great to know that they are selecting on something that means something like these people are voting at a higher rate than these folks are tfa's doing something they're not trying to find out who's voting more but in the way that they're selecting they're somehow able to identify those who are more engaged um, but there is also something going on right there which says the program itself is also doing something. Just being in the classroom in and of itself is also propelling people to have shifts in views of the world and also shifts in propensity to do normatively positive things like vote. Um, so another piece we're also trying to see if we can, um, does, the, does participation increase political ambition among underrepresented populations as the majority of those who actually apply to these national service programs, as I said, were young, but they're also young women. 70% of those who apply for Peace Corps and Teach for America are women. And uh, there is uh, an ambition gap as it relates to, you know, when you ask a typical, you know, just a college, you know, a uh, woman in college, are you interested in running for office versus a man in college? Are you, there's a big gap just consistently, right, in terms of interest in running for office. Um, and that's due to a number of things. Uh, but there is this ambition gap. So when you then see, um, you know, if you go into an organization that tends to be majority female, you're politically activated, right? Like you're showing up to the ballot box more, you have these like change in views. Are they then more interested in potentially running for office? Um, and, you know, I don't, I think I have to argue that we have issues of descriptive representation in this country, right? Um, that only when we look at Congress, like less than uh, one in five are, are women. And so using the same kind of design that I showed you before, just leveraging the RDD with, in this case, it's a survey because we're, uh, we are, we don't have, we, when we look at people who've actually run for office, the numbers are too small to really be able to say anything. So this is just more of like, are you even potentially recruitable? Like, are you open to even considering it? Um, and reporting on the survey, like, yeah, I'm interested in being contacted. Like, yeah, maybe I'd like to be trained by Emily's list to like, think about this. Uh, we see about a 10 point, 10 point percentage point increase in like just interest in participating in um, trainings to, to run for office. And when we're looking at women that, uh, the political scientists would call sort of those with more biographical availability. So those who are higher income, unmarried, 
no children, right? Like they just have more time to potentially sort of choose uh, to choose something like this. Uh, we're seeing a larger effect among women that have um, have have more economic resources and have um, family contexts in which it's easier to potentially run for office. And then we see similar effects when we're looking at just interest in participating in political campaigns in general, right? Just in terms of supporting another candidate. Um, significance of findings, right? I just explained before. Issues of, of, of gender ambition um, is, is something that we need to think about. And then finally, um, I have this paper that's looking at whether or not policy preferences shift, right? Like after you go into a program like this, and it's more specifically in education policy, right? There's large debates around education reform, charter schools, privatization. Do we um, do we have high stakes exams? Should we pay teachers based upon how well their students perform? All those kinds of questions. Do you have different views on um, contentious um, questions around education policy? And uh, it's interesting because when we're looking at just descriptive baselines, like when we're looking at how teachers answer at policy preference questions as opposed to non-teachers, the difference between those two groups are larger than how Democrats versus Republicans would answer these questions, or rich and poor would answer these questions, or African Americans and whites would answer these questions. So there's a really big difference between how teachers think about what policies are useful versus non-teachers. And this could again be, maybe it's just selection, right? Like the types of people who choose to become teachers are just of a different variety than those who don't. And so their opinions are going to be different. Um, so leveraging the Teach for America uh, experience, given that the treatment itself is like, you have to be a classroom teacher for two years minimum. Um, do you actually see changes in how you view policy? And the answer is yes, uh, mainly, um, so this was published in at Next and, uh, and then another uh, paper in Public Opinion Quarterly uh, that the kinds of, uh, you know, they're attributing differences in student outcomes um, to societal inequities, right? That's consistent with the first paper I showed you. So like, if we look at like, I know the words are kind of small here, but it's, it's things like, should we pay attention to policies that elevate the prestige of the teaching profession Brought and improve access to wraparound services, expand high quality preschool, um, allocate school funding based on student need, create a uniform set of national standards like Common Core, link teacher evaluation to pay, pay uh, link teacher evaluation and pay, um, strengthen strengthen like unions, reduce dependence on standardized tests, expand vouchers, expand high quality charter schools. So if we look at where we're seeing positive effects, it tends to be where it's. It's elevating the teacher and providing more resources to schools. They're less interested in things like charter schools or vouchers or um, um, teacher pay, like that kind of stuff is less of the point. It's more like you need to just expand the pie, grow the pie in terms of resources that go to schools, um, have, have the provision of high quality public education start earlier, right? Like start with like the preschoolers don't have that be something that parents have to pay out of pocket. Um, and uh, there's actually a drop in interest in things that are more um, market-based reform, like uh, vouchers and charter schools. So if we're looking at kind of the range of policies, we do see that teaching in and of itself does cause some changes in terms of how you view what are promising. Um, uh, levers. And uh, they're not necessarily becoming more jaded. If we're looking at questions of whether or not they think teachers can do a lot, their optimism around what teachers can do actually goes up. So they are sort of increasing in their respect for what teachers can accomplish. It's more, but they're going to only be able to do that if they actually have the resources to be able to do that, right? Um, and then finally, uh, right now, this I'm just doing a preliminary study uh, looking at career trajectories, and it does seem like there's some evidence. And this is leveraging both Teach for America and Teach for India and Teach for Australia results, um, just to see if do we see switches, uh, changes in terms of what kinds of jobs they're choosing to partake in. And, and the short answer is yes, they are more inclined to pick jobs that are focused on social social causes, uh, they are more likely to be in the education sector. Um, they're less likely to be in the private sector. Um, so that's it. I know I shared a lot of different kinds of results, but um, they're all leveraging the same kind of design. So hope I thought it was okay to kind of share the full, full gamut of things that I'm looking at. So thank you.
Uh, I have a question about the uh, voluntary aspect of the service. So Germany used to have national service for men that was required where we could do service instead of military service. Um, I don't know about other countries that might have had that. Is there something that gets, uh, are, is there data available from settings where it would seem more like a randomized uh, trial rather than that you have the selection of the so I mean, there's previous work leveraging sort of the GI um, bill, sort of like the Vietnam draft um, in the country, and that was looking at then like military service, and then it's no longer voluntary. It's based upon what day you were born. Leveraging a discontinuity, but uh, still something that was a mandatory, and so then you're it's the full population, um, and there you did see you know positive effects in terms of this, not the same kinds of outcomes, but in things like sense of duty. Uh, sense of um, kind of obligation and uh, sort of uh, pride in like, what it means to be, you know, an American, like there, there were things of that sort, like that did change. Um, so there are a couple studies that have looked at kind of military because sometimes it's been compulsive. There's been less looking at like non-military that is required. Um, so to the extent that those countries are willing to share data, <laughs> that, then we kind of start looking at this. But there's also, um, you know, so uh, there, like Teach for Israel also exists. And in Israel, there is also this compulsory military service. So like that's a different kind of context. So I'm interested in looking at these different environments of like what, what actually changes because then they're doing this voluntary thing after they've actually already been required to serve their country in some capacity. So maybe we're not gonna see as large of an effect in those places where like there's sort of this like compulsory service and then, you know, voluntary service may not do very much, um, but context matter. But, you know, to my knowledge, the only other you know, large scale studies have been uh, with compulsory military service. And, mm -hmm. so, I have a conceptual question about how you think about your discontinuity. So given that you have see this sort of discontinuity in your results, do you think of it as then, okay, if I shift the threshold, right, am I going to bump people up, right? Is that like, am I going to change people? Or is it that I'm just going to do worse on my selection? Or do you now say that, look, this is underdetermined given the data we have? I think it's probably underdetermined. I would think like, you know, if you just made micro small changes, like it's not really going to affect all that much. I mean, as I said, the threshold changes like year to year a little bit. So it might be a little lower, might be a little higher. Um, so like small changes, like I don't think it's going to change the outcomes, but sort of like major shifts, maybe because there are different kind of proclivities going in because Teach for America is like their selection score is indeed doing something in terms of finding out who are the people who tend to be more empathetic, who tend to be more optimistic, who tend to vote at higher rates. Like, even though they're not trying necessarily to find those people, they are finding those people. So maybe if you go too low, that you might start seeing kind of different patterns, but it's but not- they are trying higher. to find those people, right? I mean, I assume they like are. they're trying to find people who are empathetic, they are engaged, who will go the extra mile to teach, you know what I mean? Who care? Like, I guess that's like, I think when I, it's like, it seems like it only has its causal effect because it's selecting on those traits, right? Like it wouldn't, I don't, I mean, they are actively trying to find those people. Like that's what you want in, in teachers that are going to teach. It could be both. Yeah. Huh? Go ahead. It could be both. Oh, I mean, that's what I think is interesting. Is it just selection or? Well, not just selection. Like, I, I'm not like, I'm into selection. Like, I think selection is cool. No, no, like, I I don't, know. I'm not like saying like, oh, it's just selection. Like, I'm just saying, I don't understand how it could have its causal effect if it wasn't selecting. Like, it, it's dependent upon those traits being there in to some extent to have that. And so like, it just, it, that's why I keep saying like conceptually, I don't think that's an open question. Like what we don't know is if we actually did go into a group that like wouldn't have the inclination. We don't actually have the answer of what happens if you like just take a person who was not necessarily interested and, and have them and have them do this. 
right? Like we don't actually know that. So all I have is like are among those who are interested, here's the effect. And there is an effect even among those who like, you might think that there won't be an effect because TFA is selecting really well on certain dimensions around like empathy. They're not trying to find empathy, but they do ask questions around like, you know, what kinds of extracurriculars are you doing? Like, right, like, are you active? Like, are you a high performer? Like, are you organized? Like, do you, are you able to um, actually complete tasks that you say that you're gonna accomplish? They don't ask things like political activism as it's not, you're not supposed to. So in terms of the voter turnout, I wasn't sure if that was necessarily going to happen um, because you're not supposed to ask about your party registration. Do you vote? Like, you're not supposed to ask that, um, um, but, I, I actually think like, yes, there is selection, but I, I do think that it has an effect, but what we don't know is will it generalize if we go out to a population that wouldn't necessarily have the proclivity to apply to something like this. And so if you expand, um, so like there's, I'm interested in say like the California core that the, um, that's being invested in now, because there's then a larger group that might be interested in applying because they're actually creating a student debt-free way Right, so then it's like a bunch of people like, I wouldn't do this, but you're telling me if I do this, I don't have student debt. So then like it's expanding the potential population that might be inclined to sign up for this. Whereas like this, is, it's not doing this. Like if anything, you're like, oh, I'm signing up to be paid lower. Like I graduate, I'm competitive for going to McKinsey. McKinsey would pay me like $90,000, but if I do this teaching thing, I'm gonna make $30,000. Um, so, so the type of people, who, the types of people who are willing to do that, because TFA is not um, jerking around it as it relates to its competitiveness. Like they're trying to get those who are competitive for like top-notch graduate schools getting into top consulting, um, and they even have partnerships with like Goldman Sachs and McKinsey's and so forth to say like they get into TFA. Would you be willing to defer their contract to like let them do TFA first? So that, those are the type of people that they're trying to get. But I think I'm interested in like the California core where you might be growing the type of people, expanding the type of people that would be willing because student like, lack, like having no student debt, I think that would motivate a lot of students. But it's still selection. I guess all I'm saying is like, those are two different treatments. Like a treatment that is that entails a selection is different than conscription. <laughs> like it's not just that we don't know the causal effect if it was on a de different population, like it just is a different treatment if it's conscription. Conscription's not selection, which is great. Like again, I'm not, again, I'm not saying like, the importance of it. I, I come from a totally different view from everyone else here. Like I'm into selection. I think selection explains things, <laughs> but I'm just pointing out like it's a different treatment. But they're trying to separate like the selection part with I the know what experience. they're trying to do. I just don't know if that conceptually makes any sense. Well, and at I least in like, terms of like, you know, when we're trying to do causal inference, most of the time, like all we're trying to do is separate out the selection from everything else. Oh um, so, you know, it's not to like, I think the selection, there is like the selection stuff is doing something. I think what we're trying to add is it, there's this other part that's also simultaneously happening. So we do want to attribute some programmatic effect to like, it's not nothing, like the act of being in the classroom for two years does something, but it is only among the individuals. Like all we know for sure is it's only among the, the individuals that who are inclined to do this, right? Because this is not. Right, so, so I, I, I find myself somewhere in the middle here. <laughs> so why is it even that, right? Mm -hmm. so, so suppose I wanted to say like, look, all you're getting is selection here. And I might like selection, right? So I might think that's great that they select well. But the only difference that I've seen is that PSA selects well. I don't see any sort of causal effect. It's just the difference is due to picking out the appropriate people. Why, on, on what do you say to someone who doubts that TFA is actually, even for those selected people, mm -hmm. not things up? Mm -hmm. can, can I not? run an argument on this data just say it's only selection and then i might think that's good or bad yeah i mean like that that's when the assumptions are that need to hold as it relates to rdds like we need to test those things so um what i didn't show are the various tests of certain assumptions of if we look at demographic characteristics is a running variable basically smooth and like all the observables and it is 
Um, are there weird peaks as it relates to density of scores? No, no, it's like a nice kind of smooth normal curve. Um, do we see biases as it relates to response rate at the running variable? No, it's actually smooth. So like we do want to check all of those things. And then also, um, do we worry that we are better able to contact people who have been admitted because there might be like better contact information, more current? And so this is just, uh, there, there's other things that are wrong right at the great gate. And the answer there is like, no, as TFA was really good about separating its admissions for admissions data set with like all of the follow-up data like that they collected for their core members and their alumni. So like the messiness of the data is equal for the non-admits as the admits are. So we do want to check all of those things to just have confidence that the the assumptions that need to hold to actually really leverage an RDD do hold. And in our case, it, it does. And then that's why I also emphasize that it was really important to do kind of that qualitative work to see the processes to ensure that there is no gaming, that like all the things that they were saying around that this is an unknown cutoff that only, only like a few people know, and those people are not interviewing, that those things are all true, um, to then give added confidence that we can actually like put causal claims on this, um, leverage it, um, the RDD. To what extent would you uh, think about um, estimate explicitly the selection model itself, like who's actually applied to TFA? I, mean, I guess it's a data, it's a data problem, and then we need to have some kind of flexible some people that are probably to of a plan actually you know, get selected and get some of that for it's very low. So you have very few samples, but in general, have you to what extent like prior to the selection within yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's interesting and that is data that one could get and I mean um I haven't thought about it but like yeah you could actually like map those out because you can look at any college campus I think some in some places like at Yale something like um, over 10 percent of the graduates apply to TFA right so there's like some institutions that you can actually look at where it's not a you won't have you'll have like enough variation around like those who apply and don't apply to start seeing who are the types of people um, so I don't have the answer but that is something that could be explored I was, I was wondering if there's um, work on the if impacts of, of that kind of program on the students and if there's a similar regression discontinuity in like classrooms that are uh, assigned a TFA instructor versus a regular teacher. Yeah. So at least as it relates to uh, the student side, there, um, there have been studies and that's actually been able to leverage um, an, an RCT. So like with, so you can look at sort of like a school and then if principals are willing to sort of like randomly assign. So if they have like a non-TFA um, kindergarten teacher and a TFA kindergarten teacher, like you can randomly assign. Um, so they were doing sort of like random assignments like within schools between like TFA and non-TFA teachers to be able to estimate like our student outcomes different, at least as it relates to like math and English test scores. So studies like that have been done. Um, so it, they haven't leveraged just continuity in those cases, but it's also, it is feasible as there's, uh, there's a set of people that apply to TFA didn't get in that, you know, became teachers too. And so there, there's some things that can be done, but the, the gold standard of doing a randomization has been feasible. And so, so while expensive, those kind of studies have been done. I think there have been three um, that have been done over the course of the last two decades. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.